Evan, I've never seen you clean shaven. You look <laughs> like a new man. Well, thanks. I, I thought it was time for a change. You know, um, I, I don't know how many of, of the, the people around in the project saw me at the beginning. I was clean shaven and then then I had a goatee and then then a full beard and I just decided to chop it all off and start over again. We'll see what happens. <laughs> well, perhaps this is indicative of a of a deeper sort of shift. No, not perhaps. It definitely is because what we're talking about today, Evan, uh, among other things, is that your title has recently changed, meaning your role has recently changed within the Dash Core team. Tell us what you are called now. So there, we're, we're calling my new role the senior advisor to the the sub-organizations within the, the Dash DAO. I mean, that's kind of long, but I think it... It, it's probably better to like step back and talk about a little bit of, of what what was the intention. This was a long planned move since the very beginning. Since me and Ryan first started talking about it, we we had started talking about like how how I would shift out and then start other sub organizations within the Dash ecosystem. Because what what I really want to do is. I wanted to build out the core part of the project, get a really strong team in place, and then move to the edges of the economy and start uh, working on those and expanding that out. And okay. so as, as a strategy advisor, it allows me to, to move about the project in a completely different way and not be associated or just completely attached to any one of these individual projects that are going on. Well, that makes you sound something like a butterfly, like a <laughs> fluttering, fluttering butterfly. So, so maybe let, <laughs> let's hone in on this butterfly's path a bit. Do you have in mind the first flower you will stop at? Is there a flower on your radar? Uh, there, there is a flower on the radar. So the first flower, I guess, that I'm going to land on is uh, I, I'm thinking about calling it Dash Skunk Works. Brand new, huh? <laughs> I don't know um, what that word means. Okay. Okay, so um, skunk works in in general means that you're doing experimental things. It's it's research and prototyping. It's future proofing. It's coming up with ideas. It's um, it's very forward seeking, right? Whereas the Dash Core team is in the now. They're, they're focused on what are we delivering right now, what, what are our core values, and how do we fulfill that for the current investor base. And that's hugely important, but we also need someone or a group of people that are looking at five years and 10 years and 15 years in the future and planning. And so, Skunk works. Yeah, so I'm stepping aside. I'm, I'm pulling – I'm going to find a new founder for this organization – and then me and me and this person are going to co-create this new um, new organization within the Dash ecosystem to to start to look into these sorts of things. Hmm. Well, I, I I can't say that that doesn't make sense. It does because you you strike me as the guy who uh, does best. Uh, sort of like hacking at the bushes going forward into the unexplored territory. And then, you know, once a sort of path has been hacked, well, then yes, then then others are better at, you know, setting up camp in the cleared space. Am I using <laughs> enough metaphors in this episode? Uh, yeah, they're really good metaphors, though. I'm liking it. <laughs> well, thank you. Okay, so, okay, so Skunk Works coming on the horizon with a with a, a, a founder whom we do not yet know, and I imagine that we will at some point. Mm -hmm. Well, now, do you, are there, are there anything in particular that um, you would like to churn out of this Skunk Works first, such as like a particular topic or a particular piece of research or problem that you think ought to be solved first? So over the last few months, I've been doing lots of research, and it's it's more about determining what are our current limitations, uh, where where are we going to first start seeing hiccups, um, as as we grow, we'll we'll start hitting these thresholds where we can't grow past them because we're we're having like issues. For for example, it's kind of interesting to think that the Dash core 
um, organization itself, its employees grow linearly, meaning that one employee can only really hire another one at a time. Like you can't hire three or five people every you know few weeks for forever and expect any sort of quality to come out of that. Okay. But the Dash ecosystem grows exponentially, right? And so we have a we have like this gap there. We need to grow our our ability to to do projects and our ability to employ people also exponentially. And this this is I think going to be handled by these these other sub organizations that are starting to pop up within our ecosystem, which operate completely independently, right? And so by combining all of the forces that are, that are currently working, then suddenly we do have exponential growth. You know, um, that's just one thing. And then there's there's other other things that are cropping up as well, like. Um, how do you determine which sub-organization does what? What if one sub-organization of the DAO wants to do this specific activity, but only really one can do it? So we need some sort of ratification system. Like, we need to be able to vote as a network. This, this specific sub-organization is going to be responsible for these specific roles and duties, right? So it's like these types of things that I'm, I'm currently working on. And then um, hardware. After, after we have um, integrated into the Bitcoin ecosystem, what I'd like to do is start making hardware. Hardware that's specifically designed for Dash. So has full support into the Dash ecosystem, like ATMs, POS devices, and special devices that allow you to spend money completely securely. And this type of stuff is better handled by, you know, another group of people that that aren't so tied to all of these current ongoing things. So I think it's going to be a good mixture. I see. Interesting. So let's shift gears a bit and talk about the now, uh, where Dash currently is. Uh, how do you feel about where we currently are? Does it fall in line with where you thought we would be? Is it ahead? Is it behind? Or did you not even have a sort of prediction for the for in time? Um, I didn't have uh, so I think it's ahead a little bit. I I thought that we would hit exponential growth somewhere about here, and then um, from my opinion, I I don't think that we'll easily fall out of it unless we make a mistake, and so. The, for the current level of success, I would say we're doing wonderfully. And I, I think that the, 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 the way that I, I see this you know, going is that we'll, we'll figure out um, new vectors and in different places that, that you know, enhance the value that we're providing. And we'll actually be able to um, hopefully reliably produce that at scale. And that's really difficult as a decentralized project to do. But but I think that from from what I'm seeing in in the teams we're we're actually doing it. We have the most talented developers that I've ever worked with. Um, and so from from that perspective of all of the teams that I've worked on we're doing a fantastic job hiring people and we're attracting the best and brightest talent in the space. Um, people that you know have 20 plus years of experience look, looking into exactly the things that, that we're doing. And then we'll you know, we rely on those people to, to build out these, these products and, and then add the, the value that, that we're seeking to add to the ecosystem. Okay. As a sort of addendum to that question, I would like to define what what metrics do you look at when gauging how the network is doing? Like when you said you think we're a little ahead, uh, but doing wonderfully. Um, is this a combination of, is this market cap? Is this human talent who is on board? Is this uh, adoption within, you know, merchants in the crypto sphere? Like how, what metric or metrics do you look at? Um, I'm, I'm mostly talking about like the people that I socialize with in Phoenix and 
there's many, many newfound people that are interested in the project and investors that um, have absolutely no experience in the crypto sphere, right? So these, these are the people that I thought would be brought on by evolution. But it, as it turned out, they wanted to invest in masternodes and run them on treasures. And, and they, they want to participate in the voting and, and all of this sort of thing. And so we're ahead on that front. Um, as far as like the, the metrics that, that I'm watching, it's mostly um, the transactions that we're doing on the network. Uh, we're actually growing. You mean like transactions per block? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're growing um, faster than I thought as well. Like I, I didn't envision that we would see a huge uptake in transactional volume until Evolution launched. Okay. Um, but it, it appears as though the, the issues with the other blockchains like Bitcoin and unconfirmed transactions are actually causing people to bleed over into our market and it's starting to be used. So um, there's growth in areas that I didn't even predict that's uh, becoming quite useful to, to growing the, the ecosystem as a whole. I see. Is there is there anything that you haven't brought up already that you think that you see like a, a certain goalpost into the future? Like, yes, we must definitely do that at some point, or we must definitely do that at some point. Um, many things. So I'm going to be very active in the near future, um, in the community, and trying to push through some initiatives. Um, and I'll I'll just name a few of them to start. Um, I I'd like to do some sort of auditing for the sub organizations. As, as the sub-organizations start taking money from the network, they start out really small, right? But then they grow. Uh, there's a point at which they grow to that they should have some transparent um, record keeping that's kept to some sort of, of level on the network. Like we need to determine what level of, um, what level of record keeping do we want to keep? Because we, we don't want to be wasting money and we need to know where it's being spent, right? So the, the way that I would want to solve that or I would suggest to the network is how about we um, elect an auditor? And this person would go from organization to organization and look in the books and, and then make recommendations to, to these sub-organizations on how to, to flesh out better record keeping for us. And so as we grow, then we should be um, better at spending money. It seems like, I mean, with, uh, like you mentioned, like uh, elect an auditor, uh, books, uh, spending money, these kinds of things, it's starting to feel and has been for a while, in my opinion, like the Dash network is becoming like a cyber city or -hmm. something, like a cyber city state. Uh, and, you know, I mean, like Andreas Antonopoulos has mentioned, you know, the, uh, potent, you know, the, the coming cyber states, perhaps like ushered in by blockchains, but I mean, like, so, so going back to the cyber city thing, um, I mean, do, do you feel like, like a, like a city planner? Like I feel, I, I get the sense that you are a planner of of a cyber city. I mean, is that what it feels like to you or does this strike you as totally weird? Um, I, I think I like that terminology better than what, what I'm thinking of it as. And oh. I, cause I, I think of these as governments. Yeah. Um, yeah. For, for example, Bitcoin is more like an anarchist government. So we're, we're trying different govern governance systems and then some of them turn into these completely functional city-like things where you do need planners, you, you need a city council, you, you need boards of elected, um, elected representatives for the, the citizens, right? The citizens of Dash Nation or, right. or whatever you want right. to call it. Right. Um, and so it, it does actually feel like that. And I, I could just, I, I could see it turning into that for sure. And now here's a bit of future gazing that I would like. Um, but okay, so like we've seen how governments work in meat space, right? Like there's sorts of, um, you know, like 
pretend geographic lines basically and so like governance on the face of planet earth happens you know within like lines on the dirt uh and so i guess in that land is scarce uh the number of governments which can or do coexist is limited to the amount of dirt and and who is able to stake and claim what amount for themselves how do you see that playing out in the cyberspace where i suppose there the only scarcity is number of humans participating um i mean do you think we'll have more governments in cyberspace do you think we'll have fewer or will they all just sort of be connected like together but not together i mean where how do you see this playing out uh let let me talk about kind of like what i see in the best possible outcome okay i i would love it if a person that lived in a, a country with you know a government could have dual citizenship with an entity like dash which means that we can have competing governments or governance systems and they're competing for the the citizens money essentially mm-hmm. like we could have tax money going through these these um these institutions and then completely transparently um recording and spending and allocating and doing all of the things that the public sector does but you know with the digital twist with with all of the things we like about this space mm-hmm. and then we're we're not limiting governments to land uh governments are have always been land locked they mm-hmm. they control the land and then any anyone within their land is a citizen right whereas in the future we we could see the these borders just disappear and then many many of many options appear out of nowhere where uh the governments become less important and then these other institutions become much more important in deciding how how monies are spent and allocated and distributed and all of that can you give me a sort of vision or picture of i guess dash's uh, adoption or or reach less something like 5 years into the future and then like 15 years into the future like what do we look like what are we doing uh okay so 5 let's let's start with 3 years let's start with 3 in, years 3 <laughs> in 3 years i i see evolution being out us having well over a million users uh worldwide and then um masternode shares being operational which presses up the the amount of locked coins to somewhere between like 80 and 90%. It pushes up our market cap allowing us to um have a lot larger of a budget. And then then the sky is the limit of what we can accomplish. So then 5 to 10 years we're talking about um having pretty much been integrated into the entire Bitcoin ecosystem. What do you do after that? Well, What about kiosks, uh POS systems, um ATMs that are, you know, e- exactly made for for what we're what we're offering. The 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 thing that I've been tooling around with myself over the like, like last two weeks is could you run a bank out of a kiosk? So, a virtual bank, let, let's say that it doesn't even have ATMs and you scan a a driver's license at the kiosk which gives you an evolution account and then you can put dash into your account through through that process or you can withdraw also these these kiosks are at stores so let's say there's 10,000 of them you know worldwide now you have 10,000 places where you can go sign up for an account put money in dash withdraw money out of dash and spend money like it was a credit a credit card at the location and so what what ends up happening is that you'll have users going to one of these locations getting groceries and saying I'd like 50 bucks back so it's cash back right now you have $50 of anonymous cash that you can spend before you hit the next kiosk 
and suddenly it starts acting like a bank. Like you, you can access your money as often as you want. You can pull it out and you can spend it anonymously. And, and then with, with these kiosks, you always have complete access into the ecosystem. And so when you say cash back, you mean like paper money back. So like yeah. you're paying with Dash that is tied to your driver's license, but you can ask to receive back paper in exchange. Precisely. So let's, let's say you, you go in there, you sign up, you buy some groceries, and then you say I'd like $50 cash back just like you do in the US from your debit card. Mm -hmm. And then with that $50, now you can spend it anywhere in the, the local area. So mm -hmm. you don't really need the bank account anymore. And now you, tell you, me the function of the driver's license. What's that for? So we need to sign up the user. We're, we're gonna have to do some sort of KYC um, to, to make this work, right? Theoretically, anyway. and. To, to do that, I'm thinking, well, you would use a driver's license, vet the, the person's identity through, you know, a third party organization that is is closely associated with Dash. But this this doesn't mean evolution requires any of this. This is just for this kiosk just system, for the right? Kiosk. Right. OK. Yeah. Got it. Hmm. A bank in a box. A bank in a box. Yeah. Um, back to your earlier question. Uh, another thing that that I think I, I'd like to push through the network is we have a, an issue of um, masternode operator bandwidth. If you think about it, we have a lot of proposals on the network. The proposals get more complicated over time because what happens is we, we start spending more money on each proposal and the complexity of them just goes, goes up. Well, the masternode operators themselves don't really have they have, a, the, they have a fixed amount of time, mm -hmm. plus they're also investors and they have families and, you know, these are busy people. And so, you know, the solution to that would be, why don't we make um, a board that is a review committee for proposals elected by the network, by the masternodes on behalf of the masternodes to, to review all of the proposals and then flag them, you know, whether they support or to uh, avoid a specific mm -hmm. proposal. Mm -hmm. This doesn't mean that it would force the masternodes to do anything, right. but um, the ones that wanted to, to, you know, free up some some time and automate the process a little bit could use that, and then we would, you know, reduce waste again. I, I think a, a lot of a lot of what I want to accomplish in the near future is figuring out how we're wasting money and then cutting cutting that in so that so that we can efficiently, you know, move on to the next phase. Okay. Well, I think that covers everything that I wanted to ask you today, Evan, but I have to say, I would like to get one final comment from you before I let you go. It just popped into my head this question, which is, what is your driving motivation in all of this? Um, so I, I definitely want to create a, a world in, in which there is less corruption. And I, I think the banking industry, the governments in general, the corporations, the for-profit nature of the world, all of those are in conflict with you know, what, what reduces corruption. And so by by making an alternative and, and figuring out ways of, of working around those issues and just providing an example of how to do it without corruption, um, we, can, we can start to, to replicate that over and over again. If, if it's not even us doing it, you know, we, we pave the way and then others uh, imitate, which is wonderful. And then the world's a lot better off after. And now, let me dig a, what is, define corruption for me, and what would a corrupted blockchain network look like versus a non-corrupted blockchain network? Um, okay, so corruption comes in many various forms, uh, but what, what I'm referring to is just the general problems that, that we've seen with you know, the, the banking industry. Like, for example, the 2008 collapse was caused pretty much purely by corruption. 
uh, there, there was a, a lot of like insider stuff going on, uh, a lot of people just trying to make a buck and not really caring about what came out of that. And I think by aligning incentives, you can, you can avoid a lot of that. And by, by building systems which are robust enough to, to kind of uh, work their way ar- around you know, people that are corrupt themselves, they, they put up a greater fight. And so the, the digital cryptographic revolution is, is one of you know, transparency. And transparency in general fights corruption alone. And so by, by using these principles over and over again and, and building out these structures, I hope to influence the, the world in a positive way. Very interesting. Well, Mr. Ivan Duffield, thank you for your time, and I look forward to talking to you when your Skunk Works launches. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you.